This is Dave Meltzer with Entrepreneurs the Playbook, and I have a very special guest because there's very few people that live in both of my worlds, and I have Gotham Chopra. He is the co-founder of the religion of sports. Sports is my religion. It's my spirituality. Uh, Gotham, welcome to the playbook. Yeah, thanks so much for having me, and such a great intro. You're it. awesome, man. Well, I, I got to get you on a conference call. My brother's a Harvard guy. I know you're a Columbia guy, but he was a biochem major, PhD in social ethics, became a rabbi. And so yeah. he doesn't understand that sports is a religion. I keep on telling him, I understand your dogmatic practice of Judaism, uh, but for me, I'd rather be on Sundays uh, where you are probably than sitting in temple uh, or yeah. any temple for that matter. Well, you know, your brother sounds like my father and I've even had this existential sort of um, discussion with him like as far back as I can remember at this point. And I will say, you know, everything you talk about in spiritual and wisdom traditions and going to temple, you know, pilgrimages and the sense of community and handing yourself over to a force that's greater than yourself that you have, you know, these, you have to believe in them in organized religion. You have to just show up in the religion of sports. I mean, you know, I grew up in Boston. So, um, you know, the Fenway Park is a cathedral. Yeah, exactly. The old Boston Garden. I was watching, you know, this crazy Michael Jordan series that came out this weekend and remembering those games. And Larry Bird says it in the interview. You know, that wasn't a basketball player. That was God disguised as a basketball player. When Michael <laughs> Jordan scored 63 points against them. So, you know, I'm, I'm a true believer. Um, and you know, I feel like I'm an evangelist for the religion of sports. I'm right with you. And I always talk about this blend from this vibration, the pragmatic world of a currency of money and object of energy that we put into the flow, blended all the way up to faith. Uh, and now that we're in these compressed times of uncertainty, and you know, I always tell people right now, acceleration is the only difference of what's going on now than compared to what goes on. There's always change. There's always uncertainty. Yeah. Yeah. There's always different things. It's just all accelerated. But most importantly, sports diverges two things that you and I deal with. One is the idea of motivation. Uh, and so I, since you're a Boston fan and I'm a San Diego guy, which makes it really bad. because when I land in Boston, I see a billboard that says it's been 110 days since our last championship, uh, yeah. right? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but, you know, fo focused in on to, to, to that motivation, I, I explain as being the Atlanta Falcons in the first half of the Super Bowl, inspiration is Tom Brady and the New England Patriots sure. winning all of the Super Bowls. Uh, and that is life as it stands today, that people have to distinguish, number one, how do I get up? But two, how am I gonna get there? And a lot of your films draw out, you know, and your podcast, by the way, with your, with your, with your dad right now for tomorrow, draw out, hey, you gotta get up and you gotta get there. Yeah. And, uh, you know, where is your perspective on that today and utilizing your platform and to inspire other people to, to feel the same? Yeah, I mean, look, it's I think the, the <laughs> Patriots Falcons analogy is a good one, because I mean, we are we're looking into something that is not only incredibly difficult right now, day to day. I mean, when you see the numbers and the data and the you know infection rates and death rates and stuff, I mean, it is heartbreaking and it's soul crushing. And yet there is a tomorrow, there is a second half or there is another, you know, part to this, um, I, you know, I, I hesitate to use the analogy of a game because I know it's so much more um, grave than that, but, you know, there is an aftermath, there is a tomorrow. And I think how we sort of prepare for it and what we're able, you know, the good news, I think for a lot of people is, you know, they're able to use this time to really reflect. I mean, we can't go anywhere unless you're, you know, frontline health worker, there's nowhere to go. I mean, I go for long walks, I go for runs, you know, I spend time with my family and I'm, I'm really trying to think of like, what, you know, what do I want to do, but who do I want to be on the other side of this? And, um, you know, the good news about working with elite athletes all the time <clears throat> is I feel like I'm able to really glean a lot of wisdom that they're able to sort of put into practice on a sports field, on a football field or basketball court. And really they'll try to apply that to, you know, life. And we hear all these expressions about control what you can control, do your job, you know, all of these things that sort of become mantras in sports. But I do think they have a larger application to life. And so I'm really sort of almost going through all of that 
you know, my, my Kobe-isms from when I worked with Kobe. I call it the Tao of Tom when I worked from Tom Brady. And sort of think of like, how do these sort of, you know, these sports analogies become life lessons? Um, mm -hmm. And yeah, I think about that quite a bit right now. And I look at the work that you have, including your new podcast is, you know, life is about lessons. And I've been blessed like you when I ran Lee Steinberg, you know, the most notable sports agency. I told everyone the best part isn't hanging out with the people that have the spirit of excellence. It's learning the lessons of the spirit of excellence right. and understanding how to take on that mindset and becoming an aggregate of the five people. You know, I sit on so many different boards, several with your dad and the Transformational Leadership Council and have been surrounded by a different perspective than most athletes. Uh, but yet, I will tell you the lessons that I've learned from the Wayne Dyers and the Deepak Chopras and uh, Ronaldo's of the world and all the different people, the sports people, those lessons are one of pragmatic nature. And you know, some of the lessons that we need to learn are about history and how human nature doesn't change. And there's people that, you know, like your father or Jack Canfield or some of my older friends like Bob Proctor, you know, people aren't gonna listen to, to those lessons, but the Tao of Tom by Gotham, you know, hits the 87% or Michael Strahan, you know, who's a shared friend of ours or, you know, and I love the blend of being able to say, look, you know, the wisdom that exists on the other side of the sideline is equal to or greater than the wisdom that we see from some of our world thought leaders. What are you using besides the medium of film to transcode these great lessons in wisdom? Yeah, well, so we live in, you know, look at us right now, you know, via Zoom <clears throat> communicating, we live in an incredible age of technology. And so, you know, even as content creators, we are shifting and adapting um, to the current set of circumstances. Podcasting is an area that we're, you know, really trying to sort of get aggressive. And, you know, there's bigger, longer, like there are documentaries that can take forever, but there's also this sort of communication. So we started something recently, actually with my dad called Now for Tomorrow. It's a podcast that's, you know, on Apple Podcasts and, and everywhere podcasts are available. But really, you know, again, going back to that idea is like we have this opportunity right now because we can't go anywhere to reflect on what is it right now that we want to do to prepare for tomorrow. Most of us, you know, are just frantically running, sprinting through life that we don't take that time to reflect. So now for tomorrow is very much about like, hey, what are those things in your life that, you know, you've been kind of like avoiding or oh, I'll just deal with that later. How can you take this time um, and how can you take these feelings of uncertainty and practically sort of tackle them? So, you know, we did an episode on forgiveness, like most people have some grudge that they're holding on to and they just haven't had the opportunity to emotionally engage with it. Well, now you do. <laughs> you have no excuse not to. So it's like, what can you practically do to sort of let go of that grudge? And so my dad, and these are really short, they're like seven, eight minute sort of things, leads people through a process where it's really like, okay, you can tackle these issues and prepare to be, you know, we're going to look what's on the other side of this is going to take so much from us, take so much energy and empathy and, and um, heart. And so I think, you know, like sort of building that strength, again, going back to sports is like, you know, Tom and these guys have worked with Kobe always used to say, it's like, you know, that strength that you need in June or July, like, or in the Super Bowl and, you know, against the Falcons in February, um, it's in training camp. It, you know, it starts in training camp six, seven months before. And so that's where we are right now. And so it's building up that tolerance and that endurance because, you know, and it's, it's going to be months and years after this that we're going to really need to, you know, reach in and, and find that strength to help rebuild. Yeah, it's definitely practice, practice, practice. And yeah. even practicing ending fear is a great practice. I love the episode about sleep. Uh, you know, as we have a lot of entrepreneurs that watch this, I, my best piece of concrete anchored, you know, pragmatic advice is to study your calendar. I took from your father, you know, studying is paying attention to and giving intention into the coincidences that we want. Of course, everyone studies what they have planned. Few people study what they don't have planned. I'm one of the very, very few people that I have a sleep mentor. Uh, I have in study sleep. I believe that 
you know, we're connected to this great source of light lessons and love. And that if I can plateau and grow from my sleep instead of the myth of Sisyphus, you know, build this big boulder up and then every morning start over. Uh, and so I really enjoyed it. I love the fact, I don't know how you convinced your father to do something in seven or eight minutes, by the way, uh, after all the years, you know, it's like a weekend with Deepak. It's, you know, 16 journals with Deepak just to get him to write the shorter books was probably difficult. Now okay. you've managed to encourage him to concisely within seven or eight minutes, inspire others to change their lives. You know, I, I hear from so many people. I mean, so many of the people that I work with and whether it's, you know, subjects of these films, are uh, young or like the people now, my colleagues are, you know, they're millennials and a lot of them, you know, said to me, is like, oh, you know, I've heard of your dad. I follow him on Instagram. You know, I love like his short things that he puts up on Facebook or whatever. I've never read any of his books, which, you know, he's read, he's, he's written like a hundred books at this point, but I really, and so I just, I thought like that audience, you know, wait, look, my dad, Ken, with the people that have followed him for years or read all of those books, you know, it's almost like he can say anything and they'll, they're there. But yeah. Like that new audience who's kind of like knows him as almost like a meme, you know, that's kind of who we were targeting. And so the sort of more, you know, digestible content um, was what we we're aiming for. But I think it also does have, you know, right now, especially people are just like looking for little things that can, and I think that are very grounded and practical. A lot of people are dealing with anxiety about, you know, the future and all the uncertainty and unemployment, et cetera. So sleep is a big issue. And, uh, you know, we just wanted to sort of really, you know, this is the existential sort of um, battle between my father and I, he's always like wanting to drift into consciousness and talk about the things that, you know, he's really passionate about. And I'm the one like, well, right now, like, what's gonna help me tonight? like sleep better. And so um, fortunately, at least for this, I've been able to wrangle him. Um, yeah, that's awesome. I uh, had a conversation once with your sister when I was big eyed. You know, when I ran Lee Steinberg, I used to complain that I would do all this work, you know, have all these meetings, and then he'd walk right into the conference room and say, the, and everyone would be like, oh my God, he's such a genius. <laughs> yeah. I've seen your dad in that position a lot of times. So it's nice to know that the vibration and cl clarity that you're bringing out of them appeals because I don't want the Bob Proctors and the Deepak Chopras and the Jack Canfields, their content to die because no one's yeah. watching it. Uh, sure. And there's so many nuggets and gems that are digestible by the majority of the audience that utilize these platforms. Um, I would be amiss because your sister told me an extraordinary story about your father uh, to make him more human, you know? And I said, you know, that must've been, and she told me about one time she asked for advice and he was writing one of his hundred books and he's like, can you go ask your mother? And it just okay. blew my mind because I had that mindset of like, this is God, you know, deep yeah. uh, Do you have one of, uh, one of the humble stories about how you guys created the podcast or something to bring a reality of you trying to convince him of, hey, you know, this is a whole different world, dad, something that humanizes him? Well, you know, I think the thing about my dad is like he's dealing with all the same set of circumstances that everyone else is right now. He's down in San Diego and, you know, in their home. He's, you know, observing social distance and making sure, you know, he's playing his part um, to help flatten the curve and all of that. So and so I think these are practical things he's going through. You know, I people ask me all the time also, like, what is the greatest piece of advice that your dad has ever given you. And I actually think, you know, the irony amongst like the many spiritual laws and everything that's out there, the thing, which I don't think he's ever published, but I just have observed and he said to me, you know, on numerous occasions is don't take yourself too seriously, you know? And, and I think like that is to me is the greatest piece of advice, which is like, you know, the, the world is always so mysterious I and mean, what we're going through right now is, you know, is so mysterious, but the greatest mystery in all of it is our own existence. I mean, it makes no sense, you know? And so I think, you know, that idea of being able to let go and just sort of have some perspective is the greatest piece. And he reminds us of that. And, you know, my dad's like voraciously, you know, looking at trends and <laughs> trying to understand data right now and try to like, you know, find the silver linings to everything. Um, so it's it's not unlike, you know, everyone else. I'm sure people with their siblings and their parents and stuff like that, just trying to find, you know, the good news. And he's very much, you know, um, kind of in that realm as well right now. We talk a lot these days, so. 
That's awesome. It must be nice to do a podcast with your father. Yeah. Yesterday was my father's birthday. He would have been 83. He passed, but I was thinking about you as I was preparing for this going, man, I've been so nice. I'd love to have had a platform to share. Uh, especially, you know, it's funny because Wayne Dyer is one of my mentors as well in the yeah. same genre as your father. He used to tell the story with Xander's about rule number six and rule number six was don't take yourself so seriously. Yeah. Um, another one might just be kind. These, these simple rules. Through that, though, you know, you have your own career. You have your own separate brand, self-made in a completely different genre. Although it's, uh, like we both know, maybe not everyone agrees with us, but I believe it's completely aligned and synergistic with what your dad teaches. Um, moreover, you've learned a lot of lessons for some great people. You've partnered with great people. What lesson would you like to share for today as your own Gotham Chopra uh, to those people out there that may be struggling um, and may be scared, may be separate, inferior, superior, anxious, angry, and some sort of ego-based consciousness. You have such a great perspective of all these different worlds, including my world of sports. What would you uh, like to tell them right now what they should yeah. be focused in on? No, it's a great question. And I think, you know, I, I, you know, I'm in a, I would say a privileged situation, you know, in a very safe place with people healthy, you know, my whole family's healthy, knock on wood. And so, you know, I have the luxury of being able to sort of sit back and, and think and reflect a lot about, you know, where I am now, where I want to be, you know, a month from now, et cetera. I'd say, you know, to whatever extent people have that opportunity to really reflect and, and be thoughtful about, um, you know, what they want to do and building habits. I mean, just very practically, when you mentioned sleep, I mean, sleep is something so important. So if I could sort of, you know, again, I've, this is not like my own sort of creation. I've learned it from my dad. And then I've observed it with a lot of different athletes I work with, which is sleep, diet and nutrition, some regular form of exercise and movement, some form of reflection, so mindfulness, meditation, going for walks, yoga, all of these different things. And then the last one, which I think is really important, and you kind of mentioned it already, is that, you know, kindness, empathy, you know, service, um, seeing it with healthcare, like how, you know, right now sitting at home is, is an act of service, right? Or, you know, we're staying healthy ourselves, but we're helping you know, redu reduce and flatten this curve. So I think just sort of being of service to our community and, and saying, how can I participate? How can I help? You know, if you are fortunate, like how can you, you know, it's going and having takeout, feel, takeout food and leaving a nice tip. I mean, that's an act of service right now because of how many people are struggling. So I think just sort of being aware of like, you know, everything around us is, is really important. Um, and, you know, I would encourage people to, to think that way. I think you're right. I think we have to think about now for tomorrow, no pun intended for your new podcast uh, with your dad. And you're just an extraordinary person. I've waited a long time to finally meet you. We live so close and we've missed each other throughout. And the one thing that I love about this compressed time of uncertainty is I get to finally have the time and others have the time to sit down for 20 minutes like this and learn so much. And I'm so grateful for you, Gotham, and uh, look forward to someday meeting you in person and giving you a real hug. Sooner than later. I really appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Incredible Gotham Chopra, the co-founder of Religion of Sports, here with David Meltzer on Entrepreneurs, The Playbook.